Well, um, talking about World War II and um, causes um, and events of this war, I'll talk a little bit about effects when we get to the end. All right, so let's get on with this. Hi, I'm Maddie again. Um, so you can talk to me on my Instagram, but I'm just going to talk to you about World War II for the next probably 30 to 45 minutes. So let's get after it. So we're going to start with the causes of the war. Why do we care about um, fascism, Nazism, communism, and how it relates to World War II? So um, I found this nice little graphic that kind of shows you some of the major causes. So the rise of the dictators, thinking about uh, Stalin and um, Hitler and uh, Mussolini in their respective places, the Treaty of Versailles and how it treated um, Italy and how it treated Germany. Well, like just Paris peace conferences in general, Italy didn't get all that they wanted out of the Paris peace conferences. They didn't. They only got the small little chunk of Germany, um, and they wanted more. So that's kind of part of the reason why they go off and invade some places. Mussolini wants them to expand even more, and um, Germany, of course, we've talked about how um, the Treaty of Versailles humiliated them and it crippled them economically. So. Um, Rise of fascism, talking about what that with Italy, expansionism, again, economic depression with the stock market crash of 1929. And generally, um, after World War I, Europe wasn't doing too hot. Um, everyone was trying different ways to bring money back to the citizens of their specific countries. Um, in the United States, for example, remember we have the New Deal. But um, over in Germany, there's major inflation and so when this guy says hey i can fix all your problems people start to um kind of believe him and that's part of the reason why he rises so far to power anti-communism again that was so major part of fashion fascism um in italy and um uh, germany specifically um appeasement with neville chamberlain um it allowed germany to expand so quickly Militarism, again, we talked about how in Germany um, there was a buildup to, um, they, they go to the Rhineland and they build up their military. And um, nationalism is a cause of basically everything. Nationalism ties into fascism so very nicely. It's part of the main, um, one of the main parts of fascism. So this is a nice little graphic that also kind of compares and contrasts fascism, communism and Nazism. So, um, yeah. So communism, Nazism, and fascism go very nicely together. Communism, think Joseph Stalin, Lenin, and, um, and um, Trotsky, fascism, Mussolini, and Nazism with uh, Adolf Hitler. Go back and look at your Germany readings. Um, I guarantee you that uh, there are some videos about that. Look at your isms, definitely. Um, so here's a couple of the main causes of, the, of World War II that I think need to be explored. So um, with this kind of expansionism that we talked about in this slide right here, expansionism. Hey, oh, hi, that's expansionism. Um, you look at these um, aggressive actions taken by the Axis powers, um, Manchuria being Japan. Um, so Japan, after the Treaty of Versailles, Versailles, God, guys, I take French, I still can't pronounce Versailles, the Treaty of Versailles, um, Manchuria is, um, invaded by Japan in 1931 and 1932, um, which is a huge act of, um, J Japanese aggressive, aggression at the time. Uh, China was in civil war, um, the nationalists versus the communists. And so they're not the most focused. And so Manchuria, again, sends China into chaos. In 1935, Italy invades Ethiopia. The Ethiopians put up a nice fight. Um, here's what I wrote down about um, Ethiopia and Manchuria. In Manchuria, Japan plans to make it a part of its new order in Asia. They want, they want to reshape Asia um, into a Japanese image. Um, this leads 
to economic sanctions uh, against Japan by the uh, by uh, the uh, League of Nations, which is League of Nat Nations. Something that is, makes them different from um, the United Nations is that they can't pose military sanctions against uh, against aggressor nations. Um, so they impose economic sanctions. Japan's like, whatever, we don't care. And they leave the League of Nations. And in 1935, with the invasion of uh, Ethiopia, known as Abyssinia, by the time um, it was invaded, conquered, and annexed by Italy. And um, it kind of ties into this idea from Italy that they want to control everything around um, the Mediterranean and the Adriatic Seas. They're thinking of it as a Roman lake. They want to reestablish this glory of a new Roman empire. Um, and then another thing in the 30s, we have um, German remilitarization. This goes directly against the Treaty of Versailles. Um, so there was, again, limits on German military placed by the Treaty of Versailles. So Hitler is like, nah, because he hates the Treaty of Versailles so much. Um, and he reintroduces conscription and um, a, re, a new, stronger German military. Um, and that is going directly against the Treaty of Versailles, which kind of causes people to think, huh, um, okay. But they do nothing about it because it's the 30s. Um, with the Spanish Civil War, so General Francisco Franco uh, leads a revolt against the uh, royal legal government. And he becomes a dictator, but um, he receives aid from Hitler and Mussolini. And this is where uh, Hitler tests for the first time Blitzkrieg warfare, um, this lightning warfare. And um, this is pretty, pretty big. Um, Spain doesn't do anything during the war, but this is the first time that you kind of see Germany um, use their army in the way that they will in the beginning of the war. Um, going back over to the Pacific. Um, and in Asia with China um, after Manchuria is invaded. And in 1937, um, Japan decides to further invade China and take more of it. Um, they go into um, Nanking, which is the capital of China at the time, and it's known as the Rape of Nanking. And it is this... I was thinking about putting images of this on here, but then I realized, no, this is too hard to look at. Um, the rape of Nanking is something that still um, is a huge issue in um, negotiations with Japan. Japan does not acknowledge it. It is um, a part of what we see as these huge destructive things that happen during wartime, specifically in this war. Um, Moving on to the Anschluss, um, I got to get off of a still a heavy topic. So um, Germany uh, takes and invades Austria to unify of all unify all German peoples. Hitler is from Austria, so this makes a lot of sense. He wants to integrate his own home um, country into his German empire. Um, with the Anschluss, yes, there was a referendum, but it was, it was rigged. Um, so moving on, another act of German aggression is, um, in Czechoslovakia. So, um, Germany wants to get, um, the Sudetenland, which is this land surrounding, like on the borders of Germany and, uh, Czechoslovakia, which, where there are traditionally, um, German speaking people there and um it he convinced um so Mussolini decides that he's going to arrange a kind of a Munich agreement a Munich um conference where there's a Munich pact um and Chamberlain and uh Hitler Chamberlain agrees to let Hitler have the um Sudetenland of course not consulting Czechoslovakia oh well um, if, as long as Hitler promises not to invade the rest of Czechoslovakia, um, you know, because Chamberlain trusts a guy's word. <laughs> we'll see more of this. Again, as Germany keeps doing more things, people are like, Chamberlain 
it's like, well, we'll just give you, it's like, um, if you've ever seen the thing, it's like, if there's a kid, a little, little kid, a really spoiled little kid, and they're walking around, and they're like, Grandma, I want that, and then Grandma's like, no, you can't have it, I want it, okay, you can have it, and then they do the same thing over and over again, that's kind of what we're seeing with Germany um, in the 1930s, in these acts of aggression, they want the thing, they're going to get the thing. Um, and then, so Albania is an act of Italian aggression. So in 1939, Italy invades Albania and decides to add Albania to their Roman Empire. Um, this completely gives Italy control of the Adriatic Sea, the little sea between um, Italy and Albania. Um, making that step towards this new Roman Empire. So Poland. Poland is a huge issue. So Poland um, was recreated after uh, the with the Treaty of Versailles after World War II. It was basically pulled from Russia and Germany and just kind of, we have Poland now because um, it goes back to like Catherine the Great with Prussia and Russia and they took over parts of Poland. They just kind of sucked in on it. Um, if you want to learn more about that, Extra Credits did an amazing series about uh, Catherine the Great. So that kind of gives you, basically, Poland existed, and then it didn't, and now it exists again. Um, and so Poland, uh, what Germany wants, specifically, what Hitler wants is Liebenstratum. Liebenstratum. If those of you who are in German, <laughs> correct me when I say things very wrong in the comments below. Um, I don't take German. Sorry. Um, but Liebenstratum, Liebenstratum, ah, I can't talk, but basically it's living space for the German people, um, and, uh, Poland is a part of that, they want to remove Polish people and resettle them with Germans, because German farming was not very efficient, and for them to have this Germanic empire, they needed the farmland, um, so, to, before they invade Poland, Hitler hits up his not so much of a friend Stalin. He's like, "Hey, hey Stalin, um, how about if I invade Poland, you don't act aggressively?" And so, with this, they sign this ten-year non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union. They're like, "Well, when we invade Poland, we'll take half. You take half. Half seas, right?" Um, and this basically gives Germany the okay to go invade Poland from the Soviet Union. Now, um, Chamberlain and the guys in the West are like, um, we're actually going to do something now. So um, they're like, hey, if you invade Poland, we're going to go to war with you. And Hitler's like, okay. And um, since he... The reason that he goes to Stalin is because he does not want to open up a two-front war. He saw what happened with um, the failure of the Schlieffen Plan, and um, he actually counts Russia in on this. He kind of um, he thinks about Russia, unlike the um, Schlieffen Plan um, in World War One. Um, so Hitler is like, okay, because now he has a way of not having two fronts. So that's pretty cool with him and so on september 1st 1939 hitler invades poland leading to two days later for france and britain to declare war against germany and we have our start of world war ii in europe now some can argue you can argue that um since china and um japan have been at war um since at least 1937 even back to 1931 um, you can say that World War II has started and has been going on for a long time, or it starts with 1939. Either way, it's a global war at this point now. So we're moving on. So basically, this is the idea that you need to have. The reason that we have this war is um, fascist regimes in Germany, um, Germany, Italy, and uh, Japan have lead to acts of axis aggression leading to world war ii this is a little this is an actual headline from the boston evening globe um after 
Poland is invaded. So we're moving on. Um, mint, yes, mint. So um, remember how we have um, Maine? Well, we have mint for World War II. So mint stands for militarism, imperialism, nationalism, and totalitarianism. Totalitarianism being in Germany, Italy, Russia, and Japan. So that is your uh, um, your little um, acronym for this unit, MINT. So remember that, that's gonna help you out. Um, so we're going into next part, events of the war. Why did the Allies end up winning this war? What happened? Why are we still America and not invaded by Nazi Germany? Um, so this is a little timeline that I found and it kind of puts everything together. So um, we can talk about, I'm gonna just go through and talk about a couple of events. So we talked about the Japan, Japanese invasion of Manchuria in 1933 when Hitler becomes chancellor. Um, remember, uh, President Hindenburg basically appoints him chancellor and then race dies. And then um, there is the uh, burning of, what is the building's name? I'm going to be, um, you know, like, freak out if I can't remember the name of this building. What is it? It is, um, with the burning of the Reichstag. Yes, the Reichstag. So, um, in 1930, in, um, the Reichstag gets burned, basically leaving Hitler and the Nazis as the only political party uh hitler declares that nazism is the only political party and there is no other politics allowed in 1935 the nuremberg laws are issued um the nuremberg laws if you remember um the nuremberg laws um are these sets of rules and restrictions um for jewish people living in Germany in the, in the 1930s. Um, one of those rules is if you're German, if you're German, you can't marry a person who is Jewish. Jewish being, uh, one part of the definition of Jewish is that um, one or more of your grandfathers were Jewish. So yeah, that was the definition that they went with. Um, and so, and Italy invades Ethiopia in 1935. In 1938, Kristallnacht. I think we did a thinking journal prompt about this earlier in the year. Kristallnacht being the night where Jewish businesses were um, broken into, and um, Kristallnacht night of, night of glass when their storefronts were broken, and just an act like active vandalism across Germany. So. Um, Another event in the Holocaust, leading up to the Holocaust. Um, 1939, Germany invades Poland. In 1940, so Germany and France, well, Germany had been kind of doing some business up north in um, Sweden and Norway. So what's interesting about Sweden and Norway is that um, I believe it was Norway had um, oil stores and... Um, so Germany wants to take control of that. France and Britain don't want that. But Germany basically makes this huge sweeping motion, kind of like the Schlieffen plan. But they go up north and they um, gain these um, supplies of, uh, of oil and fuel. And then they go through France. And there's this little, little place in France, um, the Ardennes Forest. And France believed that it was impenetrable by tanks. And that little gap in the Ardennes is what allows Germany to make this huge encircling move and push France and Germany to, um, to Dunkirk in Belgium. And Dunkirk is with um, Operation Dynamo where they essentially use ships, civilian ships even, and they pull French and British soldiers um, this is a part of, um, if you remember, 
something you can remember about um, Churchill. This is his. Um, This, this is his it's a famous speech i'll have to remember the name of it um put down the comics if you comments if you remember it i can't remember the name of the exact speech but it was um i think it's darkest hour yes the darkest hour speech there's a movie made about this if you have time i 10 out of 10 would recommend darkest hour it's a movie about churchill at the time of dunkirk when you're done with that, you should go watch Christopher Nolan's movie, Dunkirk. It is a really incredible film. I loved it. Um, I went and saw it when it came out. It really, it does a really good job of portraying what was going on in Dunkirk at the time. Um, add that to your summer movie list. Um, so at this point, France is invaded and Britain, France surrenders later after Paris is taken and it's split into two parts. The northern France um, with Normandy and Paris, um, that becomes ocup an occupied zone. It's a German buffer between Germany and um, Britain. So it's where they occupy with troops. And um, in the south of France, there's Vichy France, V-I-C-H-E-Y, Vichy. Um, and it's a pupper go puppet government um, headed by this guy named Patin. He was a um, he was a general in World War One, but it's a puppet state by the Germans. Um, it's not really France. Think about that. It's not the real France that we think about. And so um, de Gaulle, D E G A D E G U L L E, this um, other World War One uh, general, he is heading up his um, Free France movement, and he works with these underground French resistance people who, um, if you ever have time, read about them. They're super cool. The French resistance is really interesting. Um, so if you have more time, look into that. I really suggest learning about that. Um, <laughs> more about my weird obsession with uh, World War II. But um, de Gaulle heads the Free France movement. So there's two parts of France at this point. And then in 1941, um, to think about this, so um, the United States was isolationist after World War One. They wanted to go back into our little bubble and avoid everybody else. We didn't want to get inv involved with another huge European war. Um, so in 1939, we passed a Neutrality Act where people get, where we officially stay neutral in the conflict. Um, and um, it's kind of, a mess because it means that we can't provide, uh, FDR does not like this, um, we can't provide uh, materials to help um, our allies in Britain and France. Um, so, um, at the time of 1940 to 1941, Britain is the only ally standing um, until Germany invades Russia. But, um, Basically, Germany opens up this airstrike against Britain known as the Battle of Britain or the Blitz. The Blitz. Um, it's this huge loss of civilian life and it's bombings. Um, if you ever see the Keep Calm and Carry On posters, I actually have one in my room. Um, they were from the time of the Blitz, just reminding the British people to carry on, keep doing their duty that uh, br st stiff British upper lip keep going no matter what. Um, and it eventually the Royal Air Force helps a part, is a part of this. But um, Hitler diverts first forces that would have been used to invade, do a land invasion of Britain. Um, and instead he uses them while, um, so Italy, Italy is doing some things down in North Africa. They're making some pushes toward, they try to, they push through Northern Africa. I think it's, Al, it's um, I have to remember, um, but they push through a French and British occupied um, country and they try to go into uh, Egypt and then Britain's like, nope, bah. and so Italy's like pushing back and then they're getting pushed back by, German, by uh, Britain 
the point where uh, Germany has to step in. They send um, a little known general by the name of um, the Desert Fox. God, what is Erin Want Rommel? Right, Rommel. Rommel's cool. I like Rommel. I really respect Rommel, not gonna lie. He's really cool um, with the way that he operates his um, forces. Um, also did not appreciate Hitler all that much. So that's pretty cool. Um, but Rommel is sent down and he helps with the North Africa campaign. So the troops that would have been invading Britain are in Russia, invading Russia or doing stuff trying to do the North African campaign and supporting the Italian flubbery. So British, the Brit, uh, Britain is staying safe-ish. Um, so um, in 1940, there's a destroyer, destroyer naval base deal that um, the Brit that the United States has been producing battleships and prepare preparation. People thought that after 1940 that we would be going to war. Um, so there is a peacetime draft, um, but we have too many battleships, and so we um, sell those to Brit Britain and other allied nations. And so when in 1941 we um, provide the Lend Lease Act. So we allow, it basically allows us to give wartime goods to allied nations. Um, we lend and lease them. Um, remember cash and carry. There's a lot of them from last year, if you remember those. And um, leading up, part of the causes of uh, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor is the embargo of strategic war materials to Japan. We um, basically embargo um, rubber, oil, steel to Japan. Japan doesn't have all that many natural resources. So Japan doesn't like that. And so in on December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, according to President, uh, F, uh, President um, Roosevelt, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, um, the Japanese bomb the American Pacific Fleet at stationed in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Um, this is at like, I think nine in the morning. Um, it's a Tuesday, I do remember that. I had to do an entire written report about this in sixth grade. So I know a little bit about Pearl Harbor, but Pearl Harbor, basically the United States ignored all the warning signs. We had Jap Japanese code. We knew that this attack was coming. We just did not tell Pearl Harbor it was coming. And that was our major mistake. So um, the uh, United States, um, so Japan attacks the United States and um, it declares war on the United States immediately. Um, and if you, so there are a couple of major battleships that are destroyed. Um, I believe it's the USS Arizona and the USS Oklahoma that are the two major ones. But um, the United States fleet is um, destroyed. They have to repair it. They have to get new battleships. So it takes us a couple, couple um, months to get back into shape so we can go off and fight the Japanese. At the same time, um, right before Pearl Harbor, the Japanese attacked um, the Americans in the Philippines, General Douglas MacArthur is there. Um, I read that. About, I read a lot about that in a book written by Bill O'Reilly called um, Killing the Rising Sun. It's a really interesting book. Um, Bill O'Reilly does some really cool ones. I like Killing the Rising Sun, Killing Hitler, uh, Killing Patton. They're really cool. They talk good about, um, about World War II. Is there killing Hitler? I'm not sure. Um, it might be. There's something about Nazi Germany. I think killing Patton probably is the one that mentioned. No, that's killing Hitler. There's something. There's one that I learned a lot about Rommel in. So, um, yeah, there's so much reading that you can do about World War II. Okay, anyway, I'll talk more about Midway and Stalingrad later. L.L. Maine is the first time that the United States sees contact in the war um, in the... in uh, 
the European theater. It's actually in North Africa. Um, 1944, D-Day, I'll talk about that later. FDR dies. Um, that's important because it switches leadership to Truman. And then um, Hitler dies, Germany surrenders, Okinawa, Iwo Jima, Nagasaki, and Hiroshima. We'll talk about that stuff later. So um, conferences, um, the t I'm going to pronounce that so wrong, Tehran, I think. Um, the Tehran conference was in Tehran, Iran. It was from November 28th to December 1st, 1943. And it's basically the big three you need to know. Churchill, Stalin, and FDR. So this is when Stalin's like, hey, guys, we um, would like for you to take some of the pressure off of us and um, open up a second front in the West. Um, and that was basically when we started planning D-Day. Um, we'll talk about D-Day later. Yalta, um, you hear about Yalta a lot. Um, it's basically when they talk about the invasion of Germany and they start to talk about how um, post-war, what Germany's gonna look like and what Central Europe is going to be. Um, that is in the United, uh, the United um, USSR. It's in uh, the Soviet Union. Um, Post-Potsdam. Um, that was in occupied Germany. So Truman, at this point, Roosevelt has passed away. Um, and so that means that Vice President Harry Truman has taken his oath and he is now president. And um, after Germany surrenders, it's how the um, it's how the allies decide to go apart, breaking up Germany and making it so that the Germany could not be um, united under the Nazis again. Um, and so... You have um, Western occupied zone um, with Britain, France, and the United States having their own little zones. And then, of course, Berlin being completely in the Eastern Soviet zone, being broken up into four pieces as well. Um, East and West Germany, that is kind of how, that's where that entire um, idea has come from. That's in Potsdam. So here are some turning points. I'm going to flip to some images from these different battles. but. Um, Stalingrad. Stalingrad is one of those battles that is just so ingrained in military history, and people will just talk about Stalingrad forever and ever. Um, but Stalingrad is this Soviet last ditch. They are going to hold Stalingrad. They are fighting inside of houses, like they're 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 high, they're fighting to the last man in every part of the. Um, entire city, and so the Soviet forces hold off this advan this advancing German German Third Army, and um, it is because of this Operation Barbarossa that the Germans do, and it's when they invade Russia. Don't invade Russia in June because the, in the fall there's a muddy period, and then Russian winters are the absolute worst. So Stalingrad happens to be when it's one of the coldest recorded winters in Russian history. And it happens to happen in 1943, uh, 1942 and 1943. So um, it's a part of this, like the Germans, the, the Soviets take pride in their winters. It's like a defense mechanism. And so they fight Germany to the last man in Stalingrad. And um, the victory at Stalingrad a, it helps um, improve um, morale and um, basically Stalingrad allows for um, the Germans to be pushed back by the Soviets. This is a six month siege by the Germans. Here's an image from it. It is basically a huge amount of 1943 and 1942. 1942 into 1943, they almost decimated the city. It was such a destructive battle. Um, you would look up pictures seriously. I recommend it. It helps you kind of understand the like gravitas of the battle. So moving on into the Pacific, um, the Allied naval ships crippled um, the uh, Japanese army in. Um, at the Battle of Midway. This is after the Battle of the Coral Sea, which basically denies Japan from taking over all of the
the Pacific, but um, the Allied naval ships basically destroy this Japanese fleet because Japan had this incredibly huge um, Jap offensive. And after um, Midway, um, it st sparks this Allied counteroffensive known as island hopping, which moving on to Guadalcanal, Guadalcanal is um, basically when we provide this foothold for island hopping, where General MacArthur um, uses the strategy. And um, it basically provides us a foothold in Japan um, to port. <laughs> it provides a foothold so that we can possibly do a um, feasible land uh, invasion. So here's um, Midway. It was a sea battle. And here is Guadalcanal. So Guadalcanal was in the British Solomon Islands. But um, look at that image. All of these are black and white and a little bit fuzzy. Sorry, guys. Um, can't really fix that. I don't know how to. Um, but now we're going to talk about D-Day. Um, D-Day was in um, Normandy, and it happened on June 6, 1944. What do we need to know about D-Day? Um, well, D-Day had multiple different phases. Um, there were bombers, and then there were paratroopers, and then there was the actual invasion itself. So, um, General Dwight Eisenhower um, is the commander of this, and um, if you if you can stomach carnage, I would suggest watching the opening. Um, the opening scene of, scene of Saving Private Ryan, um, this, it's the Omaha Beach sequence, and it basically kind of shows you what it was like going to D-Day. Um, people, like, you have this perception that D-Day was, wow, it's such an arousing and incredible uh, victory, yes, but it was hard fought. It took, it took, like, after the day, yes, we had the beaches, but um, there's still so much to do to fight through you had to fight so much and there was barbed wire and the cliffs. Um, something really cool that I got to see was at the National World War II Museum, um, there is an exhibit of D-Day. And what's really cool about that is um, you can see the guns and you can see what it basically looks like right before the attack. Um, but D-Day is the largest sea invasion into occupied, it's the largest sea invasion of any kind, but it happens to happen into this occupied zone of France in the north, and it allows for this opening up of the second front, which was something that the Soviet Union wanted from the, um, from the, um, uh, the Tehran Conference, the one in 1943. And um, this allows for this eventual push into Berlin. Of course, there's still the Battle of the Bulge, where Germany tries a last-ditch offensive, gets stopped, and basically D-Day is this last um, major push into Germany. Um, so here's an image from D-Day. It's the little boats, the landing boats. Um, there's so much that could have gone wrong with D-Day, and I think um, people, you guys should totally... Do your research. Learn a little bit more about D-Day. It's so interesting. So um, basically, after D-Day, we have after D-Day and um, island hopping, we get to the point where um, the United States and Britain are on the western side of Berlin, and um, the USSR, after the Battle of Stalingrad, have this huge counteroffensive. And they push into Berlin, and they take Berlin. The Soviet Union takes Berlin, and it is Victory in Europe Day um, on May eighth, nineteen forty-five, because um, Hitler um, kills himself in late April of nineteen forty-five, and uh, Germany surrenders in early May. They unconditionally surrender on May eighth, nineteen forty-five, after Hitler dies, um, and then later. In uh, September, after the Allies dropped the atomic, well, after the United States drops the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, because we have a foothold, um, we have a foothold because we take Guadalcanal, Lady Gulf, 
in Guam, um, Iwo Jima and Okinawa, what we need to know about those two battles, they were hard fought. All of the little um, island hopping battles, because it was so small, it was so easy to hard fought. And um, Japan had this mentality of, we will never surrender. You will have to kill every single one of us before we surrender. And um, so you see that with um, the way that Iwo Jima and, um, and uh, Okinawa were fought. And so President Truman, after um, we are got into attack rage in Iwo Jima and Nagasaki, not Nagasaki, um, Okinawa, um, he kind of weighs what would possibly happen if there was a land invasion of Japan. And he basically decides that it would cost a lot of American lives, but it would also cost just as many Japanese lives as the bombs that would drop. So they decide to use the atomic bombs for the only time in history. It's a weapon of last resort. And so um, on August 6, 1945, they drop a bomb on Hiroshima, which is the army headquarters. So it wasn't a civilian target. From wasn't predominantly a civilian target. Of course, there were still civilians caught in the crossfire because that's how war works. Um, and then on August 9th, three days later, um, Japan still hasn't surrendered. The United States decides to drop the, another atomic bomb on Nagasaki, which is an industrial, uh, military industrial city. And um, right the day before, August 8th, Russia declares war on um, China and they invade Manchuria. So that's kind of, that also leads to the Korean conflict, which is in the 1950s. But basically since Russia starts doing stuff in, um, it went, since Russia starts doing stuff in Asia. So that along with the Nagasaki bomb causes, um, causes uh, Japan to surrender um, they announced their surrender on August 15, um, 1945, and um, they officially surrender and they sign. Um, they sign on September 2nd on the USS Missouri, and um, that allows for us to have a victory in Pacific, the VJ Day. Um, so, yeah, puzzle pieces leads to how we end the war. So. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the Holocaust. So I did some research trying to kind of figure out a general number that we can kind of wrap our minds about because we have a number for the amount of casualties of World War I. This is the amount of casualties of just the civilian um, casualties of the Holocaust. These were um, non-aggressors in the war. These were not people who were fighting. These were people who were just killed because they were who they were. Um, so these are Jewish people, Catholics, uh, Jehovah's Witness, disabled people, Slavic people, gypsies, communists, homosexual and homosexuals and dissidents. This is based off of the, I went on the National uh, Holocaust Museum website to try and um, look at what they had for their numbers. And so I added up what they had for their numbers for every single um, group. And um, this is the best. Um, this is the best estimates. Um, so, eighteen million six hundred fifty-three thousand nine hundred people were killed in this um, deplorable. Um, this so sad. Um, it was basically if you were different in Germany, you were wrong, and you were placed in concentration. I think a lot of people know about the Holocaust. We learn about it every single year, but I think it's still hard to wrap our heads around how um, how big this was. So um, this is a part of Hitler's final solution. Um, kill everyone in a massive death camp, massive death camps. Um, and it is, if you were not of their, um, Aryan race, you were wrong. And um, 
the scale and savagery of this is unprecedented and it's unequaled. Um, this is the Holocaust. It is a genocide. Um, a genocide is uh, the mass extermination of a very large group of people based on their nationality, race, or religion. Genocide. Genocide. Get that into your heads. Um, so this is a part of anti-Semitism. This is um, hatred towards Jewish people. Um, I think um, a lot of us read Night this year, and I think a lot of us kind of get what it's like, what life was like in those trenches. Um, if you have the chance and if you have the stomach, I would definitely watch um, this really powerful movie directed by Steven Spielberg. I've mentioned Spielberg twice now. Um, I would definitely watch uh, Schindler's List. It really, I think I knew, like, I knew a lot about the Holocaust. Of course, like, as a kid, I read the diary of Anne Frank. But um, it wasn't until I watched that movie that it really, like, clicked. Um, there's some imagery that really, it's it's hard to watch, but it really makes everything... Um, it really gives you the sense of the humanity of what's going on. Um, so I'm going to move on. So the Nuremberg trials, um, the war crimes trial, it's um, basically where they expose these people who are involved in the Holocaust. I would watch the History Channel that has an incredible video about the Nuremberg trials that really does a good job about summarizing it. It does it better than what I can do. But um, the Nuremberg Wars, Wars Trials, it basically exposes the Nazis who are involved in planning the war, um, planning the concentration camps. Um, and there's four main charges, um, crimes against humanity, war crimes, crimes against peace, and crimes um, toward wars of aggression. Um, this is huge. It is a huge, it's, um, Part of what was done with the Nuremberg trials um, leads to the way that we do um, international um, tribunal, international trials and um, the way that the United Nations operates um, with real-time translators. It's how the way that we organize the Nuremberg trials sets a precedent for the way that we um, the way that we do international politics now. Um, it's the first time we have this idea of an international sense of law. Um, so we're going to move on. I'll talk a little bit about the United Nations here. The United Nations is um, an organization that takes the place of the League of Nations. It can, I'm in model UN, so um, the United Nations is really interesting. Um, it's all of these different countries coming together to um, create ideas and plans that will help for the general well-being of every person on the planet. Um, so the UN does a lot of things, but what makes the United Nations different than the League of Nations is that it allows um, countries within the United Nations to band together and um, they can do military things. Um, with the Korean conflict, it wasn't, it was American soldiers under the United Nations that um, were a part of the Korean War. So um, that's what the United Nations does that is differently. So um, with the Allies being in Berlin, um, Berlin is split, split four ways. I think I talked a little bit about this with uh, Postdom, but um, if you remember in, um, yes, uh, if you remember in American history, we talked a little bit about um, the Berlin airlift. Um, basically, the Soviet Union wanted to push the rest of the year, uh, the rest of the Allied powers out of Berlin. Um, and with the help of the United States, that airlift, the Berlin airlift is a resounding success and it feeds the people of Berlin and it kind of actually fosters um, a well nation, um, like it fosters um, people who are fighting against each other, Germans and allies. Um, it joins them together and for a greater cause because people are landing in um, German airstrips, but um, it kind of fosters this peace between um, the two 
factions and kind of creates a Western Germany. Um, uh, so we're not going to talk about that. So um, overall, that is kind of what the overview of World War II is. Um, if you have any more questions, please email me. Please send me DMs. Please text me if you have my phone number. Ask me any questions. Seriously, guys, I'm here for you. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, I will see you guys later. Um, hit me up in the comments below. Um, I would definitely take a look at the History Channel. They have so many good things about World War II. Um, I would look at biographics. If you want to learn more about um, specific people who were involved in the war, definitely look at that. Um, Any more? Um, look at Extra Credits. They do really, really great little series. Um, look at Armchair Historian did a really good um, series about how uh, D-Day and what the French Resistance was doing. Um, seriously, guys, find other resources. I can't cover everything in a singular video. But I think if you guys go out and look for new resources, it'll help you guys out so much. Um, enjoy it. Um, if you have any questions or if you guys want me to show you um, some of my other resources, like my AP European book, history book and my World War II textbook about this, um, talk to me. Seriously. Um, I think I'm going to be in Titan time in Mrs. Ireland's room tomorrow if you have any questions. All right. Peace out, everybody. Um, have a good day. All right. Bye.